Hello, and thank you for joining us. My name is Jennifer Hill, and I'm a biologist at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Conservation Training Center, calling in from my home office. Prior to introducing our guest speaker, I would like to acknowledge that the National Conservation Training Center is located on the ancestral lands of many indigenous peoples. Due to the painful history of forceful removal, we could not find a full account of the indigenous peoples who occupied the land that was taken from them. However, we are aware that many indigenous peoples traversed, cherished, and lived on this land. They include, but are not limited to, the Massawamak, the Iroquois, the Shawnee, and the Delaware. As we learn more about the indigenous peoples who had and continue to have relationships with this land, we better appreciate the good earth on which we work, live, and learn. We are committed to building and sustaining relationships by highlighting indigenous communities, offering indigenous-based webinars, and sponsoring programs and activities for indigenous youth. We encourage, encourage others to learn more about the land on which they work and reside. At any time during the presentation, should you have questions, please just enter them into the chat or you can email them to broadcast at fws.gov. If we don't get to your question today, we will do our best to follow up with you afterwards. Today, we are going to hear from James Rattling Leaf about utilizing traditional ecological knowledge to advance greater opportunities to work effectively with indigenous peoples in a changing climate. James Rattling Leaf is the principal at the Wolakota Lab and LLC, whose vision is to advance greater understanding and to build effective relationships with indigenous peoples. He has more than 25 years of experience serving as a cross-cultural or broker resource to the federal government, higher education institutions, and nonprofits. He works to develop and maintain positive ongoing working relationships with federally and non-federally recognized Indian tribes, tribal colleges and universities and tribal communities. He specializes in developing programs that utilize the interface between indigenous peoples, traditional knowledge and Western science. He was born on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and is an enrolled member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. James, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. I'll now hand it over to you. Well, thank you, uh, Jennifer, um, for that uh, that uh, gracious in the uh, inv inv uh, introduction. And uh, again, welcome. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today uh, with your audience. And in our way, in the Lakota way, we introduce ourselves in our languages. So I'll do that now. Uh, we say le ampetuki lila washte na iokpia wanchi akapolo. James Rallingleaf, Imachapi na si chango lakota oyate, iyuhan chante na pechi zapolo. So, what I said today was uh, the stay is good. I'm happy to be here. I greet you from my heart with a handshake. I am known as James Rallingleaf. I am a member of the Rosewood Sioux tribe. And um, welcome. And so it's a great opportunity to be with you today and to talk about, I think, uh, a very important topic, uh, the topic of traditional ecological knowledge, and in particular, uh, the application of it in a changing climate. So next slide. So uh, I want to get you involved right away. Um, I have a question for you, two questions. So if, if you could uh, answer these questions in the chat, uh, that'd be great. Um, so my question to you to start our discussion today is what are the what are your challenges and what are the opportunities in working with traditional knowledges? Again, a very uh, high level uh, question. I know there's many answers, so I'm looking forward to your responses. So let me uh, pause here about for a, a few seconds here so you can uh, uh, go to your computers and uh, type in and chat again. What are your challenges? And also, what are the opportunities in working with traditional knowledge? And so I'll, uh... okay, next slide. Well, thank you for uh, responding to those questions. I'm looking forward to reading them as we go through um, our presentation today and, and maybe even with the question and answer time. So I, uh, 
I always bring this question uh, before the audiences that I speak to and, and for myself. Uh, the question is, what are the opportunities for greater understandings and collaborations with different ways of knowing? Uh, next question. Next slide, please. So last week, uh, we, uh, we at the ESA, and I serve as chair of the ecological, uh, traditional ecological knowledge section at ESA for familiar with ESA. We hosted uh, the White House administration. And as, if you follow uh, TEK, you know that um, there's a memorandum of understanding. Um, and it's, uh, it's to develop guidelines for including uh, traditional knowledge in federal decision making. And so we hosted this webinar and uh, it was a great turnout. And so uh, I wanted to highlight that and we'll, we'll be in our talk today with this. So again, this is coming from the administration. Uh, again, first time in my lifetime I've seen something like this ever happen. And so next slide, please. So these are the questions from the webinar. Uh, these are things that are being talked about in terms of, uh, in terms of developing uh, these guidelines. And so uh, what would federal employees to know about TK? Uh, again, these are all these questions about the processes and policies. The third bullet is what is terminology, right? You probably heard indigenous knowledge, you heard traditional ecological knowledge. So how does that all fit together in terms of defining uh, TK and ITK and how does that work within the federal context? Again, we talked about guidance documents or agreements. What's in, already in place in terms of how we should work with this? And then finally, what are recommendations uh, that we can uh, put together for the National Climate Assessment? So these are questions that were brought to us or at least presented to us uh, last week. And we know that this is going into uh, a body of work. It's been going into uh, to, to, uh, to a report, which obviously will lead to some uh, draft guidelines. Next step. Next slide, please. So, you know, from the webinar again, uh, it was important that we talked about tribal constitutions, uh, listening sessions, and, and obviously responding to the Federal Register. I think it's important, again, when we talk about uh, PEK uh, and tribal nations, uh, that we always remember that there's this thing called tribal consultations. And that kind of makes it a little bit different in terms of how we work with tribal nations. Next slide, please. So um, in preparing for this talk, I just did a quick uh, a glance at um, some of the headlines from Google in terms of tribes and climate change. And so you see this list here. Uh, you know, there's many different interesting topics here related to uh, tribes and climate change and also some with uh, TEK. Um, you know, they, they talk about tribal leadership. They talk about um, tribal wisdom. Uh, how does tradition um, use to... Um, Fight like climate change. Uh, again, tribes believe that climate change is real. Uh, we know there's vulnerability, uh, forced migrations, loss of land. Uh, again, planning for climate change. Uh, again, why does it matter to climate change? So these are all headlines that helps us think about what people are talking about, what people are thinking about, and, and in particular, how are tribes responding to climate change using their traditional knowledge. Next slide. So. You know, uh, I'm going to focus a lot on, on this interface between traditional knowledge and science. And so I use this as an example uh, to, to help people understand, maybe from a travel perspective, of how we think about science and technology. But I, uh, I use this uh, with three men on the hill. They're on horses. They have a gun. And they're looking in three different directions. Again, they're gathering information. They're making observations. And they're gathering data for decision making. So they're looking for the next campsite. And so... Again, we as indigenous people, at least from the Lakota perspective, you know, we've incorporated uh, new things into our cultures. We incorporated new tools and we use them, you know, for our benefit. We even made some of them like a horse, a relative. So there's a deep understanding of how we look at uh, new things and how we bring new things. And so when I talk about this, this image uh, to audiences, I remind them as, and remind myself as an indigenous person that our, our cultures are always dynamic. Uh, they've looked for ways to incorporate new things, really to establish relationships with these new things, but also uh, they made decisions of what they accepted and what they did not. So I thought this is interesting, and then so hit the next slide. So I, I added this little graphic of a satellite. Uh, again, since I work in Earth observation, data, and science, again, this is another new thing coming in terms of how we observe the, the planet, how we observe the Earth, and how we work with that information. Next slide. 
So it's important, I think, that, you know, when we talk about traditional knowledge, we talk about data or indigenous data. And I would say that these are important things that you have to consider. Um, I will make these slides available so I don't have to read all these things to you, but I just want to make sure that uh, we highlight these key points. Um, when we talk about this work, it really has to be in the context of nation building. I think um, we're collecting data all the time and how are we doing that um, and how we work with other people. I think data building and data governance is a key aspect for this work. So it must support that. Um, I think we need to build a community of practice of how we do this work so that we can support each other in terms of policy, uh, training, development, and those kind of things. And finally, I think that we need to think about our collaborations among ourselves, as well as those um, from the international uh, global scene. Next slide. So we, we collect, let's like those men on the hill are collecting data. Uh, they're all in all this context of telling our story in our own way. We've always been information gatherers and keepers. Our ancestors were information gathering collectors and they held information that they thought was essential to build those stories. And finally, the storytelling methodology really has been our way to sustain ourselves in our, in our future. Next slide. So again, this is going back to, uh, to our past and this is uh, what they call a winter count. This is uh, icons and images, images, symbols, and colors represented on a buffalo hide. Again, this was um, our ancestors collecting information, telling stories, uh, capturing the most important parts that are relevant to our, our times, and also a way to share that and, and keep a memory, what I call social memory of our culture and our people. And so we, we have always been those types of cultures. You know, we valued this information. This was important to us, so we captured it. And then we had people with the knowledge and the wisdom to share that, to, to promote that, but also to make the connection from the past to the present and into the future. All of you remember, many indigenous cultures have something called a seven generation concept. It means that we, things that we do today are for the future. So we have a great responsibility to make good decisions today because obviously it affects the future, but also we are connected to the past. And so we collect the, the knowledge uh, from our past we, we talk about the things that happened to us and how we adapted to it, and we carry those good principles forward. Next slide. So how we do this work, it, it begins with relationship. So this is an image that took uh, 22 years ago. You look at that picture of me in the middle, I was a young man um, at that time, but I was asked to help be a part of a, a memorandum of agreement between the USGS and Santa Gretzka University, uh, my home university in alma mater. And we used, uh, a cultural concept called Wolakota. Yeah, we call it a new way of doing business. It's how we uh, develop the new sort of a treaty process, if you will. Um, how we use an agreement on paper signed by our leaders to, to outline key areas we were going to work on together between the government and the tribal college and the tribe. And so those are pictures again of our elders who developed the protocols for this uh, ceremony. We had a ceremony with the signing and we had the leaders there as present. Uh, that's Dr. Lionel Bordeaux there next to me on my right there on the picture. Again, he's the longest uh, sort of standing university president in America. And he's been my mentor as well. The other picture with the, with the man, the elder with the eagle fan and the wapaha or headdress is uh, uh, Chief Albert Whitehat. And he oversaw this whole process of signing this agreement. And so we brought again our cultural components with the federal government uh, regulations and agreements and processes and came together with this um, agreement. So that was an important part for me as a person coming into this uh, space between science and culture. How we do this work, it starts with a solid foundation and we'll look to it's the way that we did it with this agreement. Next slide. So out of that agreement, we um, wanted to develop products that would promote data, promote PEK. And so we came up with a, a software called ResMapper and again, this was a time when uh, GIS was starting to come and become more mainstream. We wanted this product really to provide data and information to the community so everybody could understand it. It was a viewing, it was a monitoring kind of a tool that brought different data sources together from DRGs, photo orthography, satellite imagery, and even had an image of the Black Hills of South Dakota, where I come from, uh, taken from the space shuttle by the first American Indian astronaut, uh, Dr. John Harrington. So we brought all those images together and then we even defined GIS 
And I think when it comes to incorporating TK, it's important that we consider indigenous languages. So I, I'll just read this to you. It says, Uchimaka Naha, Uchapi Oyate Naha, Wamakashka Oyate, Wolokota Usutapi. So it's, it's Mother Earth and um, Sky Nation and all things living on Earth uh, working together in, in harmony or Wolokota. So that's what our elder did when he defined us, when he said we want to bring together uh, information, data, and a culture called GIS. How do we do that? And so that's how we did it. And so this this product, this ResMapper title, and the work that was started continues to work, continues to be developed, and continues to work um, through new technologies and more online um, kind of services as well. Next slide. So the ResMapper product and process is informing our, our uh, tribe. As was mentioned, I am, I am from the Robert Sea tribe, so I'm working with the tribe now on a climate adaptation planning project. And so we, we're doing vulnerability assessments, we're doing data analysis, we're always educating the community about climate. We work with 20 communities, the Chicago University is a part of this. We have collaboration and partnerships with federal agencies, and also we're working with traditional knowledge. So the traditional knowledge applications is really as interviews. We're doing interviews with uh, 20 elders from the Rosewood Sioux Tribe. And in that, we're gathering that knowledge, we're gathering those stories, and we're working to um, apply those ideas into the plan. So it, uh, so that's work that's going on right now. And so we should have a plan in about four months. And with that plan, we hope to build upon the findings. We hope to build the implementation plan. And obviously, we hope that uh, through that work, we're going to be able to help prepare the tribe for a changing climate. Next slide. So in this, in this project, um, my contribution is data. So I want to make sure that when we talk about data, uh, we want to make sure that we understand that. Uh, before, um, before a lot of this new development around data sovereignty, um, these data collection activities were, were driven by external entities. Um, and those externally controlled the data, controlled the dissemination and that. I really did lack respectful relationship. Uh, there was not very good protocols. Uh, so we were affected by that. Uh, there was no, no such thing as free prior informed consent. Uh, there was inconsistent or irrelevant data with poor quality. Sometimes it was taken out of context and really did not care about indigenous needs or priorities. So these are things from the past. I think it's important that, it, you, know, that you understand that these were things that happened to indigenous people when they talked about data and talked about especially traditional record knowledge. So these are things that we have to be, always be mindful to know that uh, these are things that happen to us, we're aware of it as indigenous people, and we want to not repeat these things. We want to take these into consideration and build upon from a positive view. Next slide. So indigenous data sovereignty is really coming online now, becoming mainstream, because we're, the, the, for instance, the White House administration wants to work with tribal nations, and so data is going to be a part of that. But I think it's important that we make sure that we think about sovereignty and self-determination. Again, those are big concepts. The tribal nations for, for, for a long time since some con contact with America have always seek to develop who they are, support who they are, and protect who they are. Um, I think it's important that when we do this work, uh, it is reflective of the nation's data, which means facts about ourselves, knowledge, information about ourselves. I think the data collection should reflect our own worldview as well, our ethics, our values, and our protocols. Um, we need to understand and respect uh, your, our inherent rights as tribal nations in our jurisdiction. We know that the data that we collect should be under our, our uh, governance structure, but we also know that this varies from nation to nation. With the 500 plus federal, federal recognized tribes in America, we know it gets very complicated very fast. But, but I think these are important concepts, important principles uh, for us to adhere to. Next slide. So again, this is a quote. I won't read it here to you, but I just, it just reminds people again in 1999 that there's a recognition again about the importance of really bringing uh, indigenous people together, uh, working together to collect data, to work with data, and to really work with our knowledges as well in more respectful ways. And so it's important, again, there's a recognition not only within America, but other nations and how it works with indigenous people and their collection of data and to respect uh, uh, our sovereignty. Next slide. 
So the ResMapper again uh, was an example, a use study, if you will, of how we thought this was the way we worked together with our knowledges and in science. Uh, we did this thing again in collaboration with our with our communities. Uh, when we collected information, uh, we made sure that it was done in a respectful way, recorded, stored, and represented. And again, it, it, we, we wanted to teach as well as apply uh, this project in terms of sharing protocols. And we understood that the community needs needed to be met. And also we need to identify those priorities with the ResMapper project. Next slide. So again, um, when, when we think about collaboration with Indigenous Nations when it comes to data and PEK, uh, we need to think of them, think of us as co-creators and co-collaborators. It's important that we have those agreements in place of how we work with the data, and they should reflect uh, customs, laws, and social norms. Again, uh, those data that is collected by Indigenous Nations should have the ability to, to, um, to protect that and control that. Um, again, local observations data contained in a respectful database we want to make sure that the nations have that responsibility and control. Again, there has to be a decision of what can be shared and what is sensitive, because we know not all data needs to be in a database. And so understanding that's important. And finally, data information must be kept in, into context. Next slide. So again, data collection analysis is based on ongoing collaboration. Um, we felt that in doing our rules but project right now, uh, we're linking a lot of our work with existing programs and projects, so we're sharing data. We're making sure that, um, that there's no duplication of effort. We're very, we're very sensitive uh, about the confidentiality of those stories with the elders, for instance. And so up front, we have a discussion in a cultural way of how they want to share that story. And, and since we're recording them on video, how do we do that and, and support we do that? Uh, again, the tribe has control over that data and how we use it, how it's analyzed, and how it's shared. Again, we must need to understand why this matters, because you know we're sovereign bodies. Uh, we have a, a unique relationship with the federal government, so we must adhere to those um, to those policies and um, practices. Next slide. So, I think in in these kind of trainings and events and workshops, it's important that. Um, that we share best practices. And again, I think, again, I'll all say this again, that, that we need to look at nation to nation partnerships. I think this idea of data and rights data is important. Uh, we're creating principles, um, we're creating a partnership based on respect, responsibility, reciprocity. Um, it's okay to bring ethics into this, I believe, that, that we need to work and develop ethical guidelines across our data and our traditional knowledge. And finally, I'd say it's training. Um, capacity development is still a big thing across all tribal nations. And how do we work together to advance um, more capacity with tribal nations is really important. So I think we need to figure out how to do that. And maybe the, the NCTC, again, is on the forefront of that. I think it needs to happen. It needs a place. And I think we need to work together to do that. Next slide. So when we do this, obviously, um, the tribes need to be, uh, they need a volunteer. Uh, it can't be forced. Um, I think um, we have to take our, there's no shortcuts in tribal engagement and working with traditional knowledge. So I think we have to really do the substantive engagement and consultation. In that, I think we build relationships. We get to know each other, we understand each other. And that allows us to begin to look at some ideas about research and how we do, how we design research. We always believe that we need to, even at times, co-design research so that the things that we do together uh, will, will or honor our values and honor our protocols. And again, I'm a big believer in this idea of indigenous knowledge data governance model. When we're collecting data, when we're working with tribes, when we're sharing TEK, uh, when we're in, in relationship, I think it, it's really important in terms of governance because ultimately it's really about decisions. How do we make decisions either as tribes or in collaboration with the federal government or partners? So governance is really important which means that we have to have established policies and practices and methods and accountabilities for this work. Next slide. So again, I think that uh, we cannot overlook capacity development. Um, I think you know we're learning about our infrastructure uh, in COVID. When, when our students have to go home and take classes online and use Zoom, a lot of our families 
could not afford it, didn't have the infrastructure computer and stuff. So I think it's important that we think about and work together to build our infrastructure on that. Data repatriation is another big one. Um, I think that finding information data on tribes, for tribes, uh, needs to be considered. And and I think that uh, it's going to be part of our partnership going, going forward. And again, with everything, uh, there is a risk assessment to this. Both partners, all partners, need to understand the importance of understanding risk and working with risk models and tools to understand as we go into this partnership, working with tribes, that uh, we all understand what the risks are. And if we have to mitigate it, manage it, then, then we can do that together. Next slide. So uh, I like this graphic. Um, I was on a panel uh, last year. We talked about indigenous engagement. We talked about indigenous data, TK, and this is what we, this was representative of our discussion. And I do think that when we talk about these effective ways to engage, um, we should not, um, not forget and include the role of other ways of knowing or other ways of communication. So I love this graphic and there's many different important things that are in this that that, uh, that we talked about and uh, in terms of what matters to us as indigenous scholars. And so I thought it was helpful today to share that with you and for you to see that, uh, you know, I'm not an artist. I think I, I love to be an artist, but I'm not. But just thinking about the role of art in terms of how we work with indigenous people, how rep art can be used to represent our ideas indigenous knowledges and, and also again the, i think the bigger bigger challenge how do we understand each other better and more effectively to the point that we can work together and solve these problems like climate change before us next slide so um one of my projects is with the north central climate adaptation science center and that's in boulder colorado and in that work uh, i'm I, uh, I i support the center in working uh, with uh, resource managers, in particular tribal resource managers in a changing climate. So these, these, these CA, you call them CASC or CASCs, so they're, they're a nationwide network of centers. And so they all work with um, state government, tribal government, local governments, really to advance climate science and data and technology. And, and so we've been working uh, with the center now for three years. And it's important work. And I just saw today um, from one of my buddies about the budget, the omnibus budget, and it sounds like uh, if it goes through, at least on the house side, they're almost doubling the budget for the N NC CAS. So there's going to be more money coming to the centers to do more work. And so we're excited if that happens, then um, you know, what are we going to do with that money and how are we going to apply it and how is it going to work with travel nation? So these, these centers are important uh, and they're supported by Congress in terms of how you do climate adaptation work. Next slide. So one of the things that we did this year in our center was develop a, a, a tribal climate leader program. And so it was a two-year master's program, full fellowship, focusing on tribal research projects, included TEK, and also concluded uh, mentoring uh, from faculty as well as tribal leadership and tribal elders. And so we named this, uh, this was a subtitle, if you will, Uti Maka Tawo Unspe Wakita. So paying attention to grammar of the earth teachings is, is, uh, is what that means. And so we tried to bring together two ways of knowing, um, use university system and, and how it supports and, and teaches and, and, and does that. But also on the tribal side, we had tribal governments, tribal elders, and tribal colleges really lead the, the application of TEK in this program. So that students then, in these five students that we went through this, you know, had the support needed to do the work that was important. And so they gave back to the tribe. The tribe supported them with the funding, full fellowship, but also in return, they help support the tribe with their research projects. So it's a, it's, it's a new thing at CU and we're very really happy it got done. Uh, we're hoping to sustain it, uh, so we'll see. This semester is the final semester for the two-year uh, two year fellowship. Next slide. So I think that, you know, some things that we have to think about also in terms of working with TK is really is developing a cultural intelligence. So the you probably saw the cultural iceberg before, so we know that what we see about tribal cultures is what we see on the top, but also we know that underneath that surface is deeper, deeper values, um, assumptions, biases, you know, things that really you cannot see, but know that are there. So it's important that you, you go from the surface and go deep. And how you can do that, I think, is through this tool called cultural intelligence. So a cultural intelligence drive, CQ drive, 
you really have to understand your motivation. What's your interest in this work? And then you focus on the knowledge. So most of us focus on the knowledge part. You know, we think about what do we need to know about tribal values, tribal history, things like that. But it, that's just part of it. The next part is your strategy. How do you prepare yourself to work with a tribal nation? Personally, professionally, organizationally, what do you need to do to know? How do you think about engaging? And then also, then finally, when you start in that engagement, when you're in the moments, in the meetings, in the planning, if something changes that, that you didn't expect, how can you adapt? How can you be ready for that change? If, I think you can because your motivation is strong, your knowledge is strong, you have a good strategy, and then when you're in those moments, I do believe that you're more likely to have a, a positive and effective outcome based on your cultural intelligence. And cultural intelligence can be learned. It can be developed. And so there's are things that we can do with this, for instance, in terms of assessing your cultural intelligence so that you can make improvements in all these four areas. Next slide. Also, I think another tool that I want you to be aware of is called ethical space. And this is work that was done in Canada during the, during the truth and reconciliation work. But it, I do think it has an application here in America and we're working uh, to, to do this in workshops. And so we want to continue to work with this thing called ethical space, a way to bring together uh, two knowledge systems, uh, to find a place where we can respect each other, respect the knowledge and the values, where we can acknowledge one another and, and admit that uh, one is not greater than the other. And finally, we believe that they don't need to collaborate each other to have validity. Next slide. So within that ethical space, then we have some definitions of, of maybe Western knowledge systems and, and uh, in uh, indigenous knowledge systems. And so you can see and compare and contrast what might be key uh, key elements of a knowledge system. You know, on the indigenous side, we have creator, earth, story, protocol, principles, and living. Maybe on the Western side, we have God, queen, constitution, legislation, policy, and science and management. So if you have those two systems, how do you bring them together? And that's where the green space comes in. That's ethical space. Next slide. So in that, these are other additional tools that help you get to ethical space. So um, on your on the circle, you see in the middle there, there's core knowledge and understanding and preparation. Um, we think organizations don't jump into ethical space right away. They got to do these three things first. And so you have to as always, understand yourself. You have to understand what, what your priorities are in your planning. And then you get to the last part, ethical space. And I think that's also important. The other tool that we have also is a, a rapid, uh, what we call reconciliation uh, relational readiness assessment. So again, you can go through these steps and find out where you're at on this on this um, assessment. And with that, it'll help you prepare to get into that ethical space so that you're prepared, you understand uh, things that you need to understand. The, the, the tribal folks also do their own assessments. And so with these assessments, then it allows us again to deep, deep and go, di go deep, deeper into our our efforts and our work so that um, we're dealing with our assumptions, we're dealing with our biases, and as an organization, has culture too, that we can find ways to uh, adjust, transform that culture so it can be more, uh, be more, work more effectively with indigenous people. Next slide. So I'm getting close here to winding up here, so I want to say that uh, uh, there are principles again. I, I do love principles, and I get, these are water principles really based on the work that's done with the Dakota Access Pipeline. So um, respect is a big one, humility, interconnection, relationality, and reciprocity. I think I'll just focus on the last one that says uh, water is a giver. Humans have the capacity and responsibility to acknowledge, uphold, and care for its gifts. So it's important to recognize again that as tribal nations that we have these principles. And uh, whenever you're in engagement, you're going to come across these. And I think it's important not only to be aware of but begin to um, to process this in terms of your own work. Um, I think humility is another powerful one. You know, water and it teaches. It's gentle again. It embodies power, interconnection. You know, as Indian people, we understand that we're connected to all things. So it just reinforces the idea that water and is connected to all uh, living beings and even our ancestors. Relationality again reminds ourselves of our responsibility to one another, to water and all things related. So it creates this um, this framework of responsibility 
uh, and roles so that we can do what we need to do. Next slide. Uh, again, um, I think we have to say this. I think uh, um, community technologies have been long deferred, been deferred, devalued, and debased. I think uh, value applied according to, uh, again, it has really been looking at it to the Western way of knowing. Um, it must be safe from exploitation. Um, that's one thing that you'll hear again and again and again. So you have to have a response to that. You have to always remember that the protocols, oral stories, and ceremonies are not to be compromised or tokenized. And finally, each of these engagements um, should be understood within the context of the individual nation and the individual culture. So these are things that, that have, have happened, and some say are even still happening today. Uh, but you need to be aware that, that these things are important to understand. These are things that, um, that we must address. Next slide. So we talk about another way, another way, a third way. And so I think that for me, this speaks to me as a person who works uh, in the space between science and, and culture, indigenous culture. And I do think that uh, these things are important. Um, I, am, I work with the Western knowledge. I work with indigenous knowledge. Um, and I try to find the ethical space, um, progress, to do things, solve problems. Uh, a third way is more than just to sum of its parts. And I do think that uh, this view can apply to all of us, not just me, but to all of us. Next slide. So as we get closer to in here, I just want to say that as we as try, as we look at managing climate this way, uh, we're beginning to, we've always monitored the climate and monitored the environment. I think we've always evaluated you know, what's happening. Uh, we've been a learning culture in so many things in terms of how we survive and thrive in our environment. And I think we've been innovators. And I think we've always done this, something called low-grade uh, low actions. So that uh, whatever we decided through trial and error, all these things didn't affect us so much if we made a, a bad decision. But it's important that we monitor, we evaluate, we learn, and we innovate. Next slide. And again, so when we did this work, you know, we understood that, you know, we had to understand uh, uh, rules for working. We had to understand procedural equity. We had to understand co-production that it is without conflict. Again, and then finally, we had to allow uh, and encourage both our partners to do joint white banding and also to understand that we had to reconcile when we had disagreements and have a process to, uh, to deal with conflict when it comes to working with climate, with data, science, and not only the past as well, but also how decisions are made, how funding is allocated, and how even the, the benefits of the research in, in terms of like papers and, and books, and again, sharing that, um, sharing that with the tribal nations uh, is important as well. Next slide. So Albert Whitehead said this, we are going to save, we're going to save the earth, we need to communicate with creation. I advise you to go back to creation, talk to them. The only way we can save our and mother of the earth is to get reattached. I admonish young people not to wait. It's good to communicate with your relatives. That's a quote from Albert. And Albert's been a great influencer in my life and, and many others around the world. Next slide. So I think it's important, again, that we know that there is a difference, and that's okay with indigenous knowledge and science. Again, I think that you know, to understand that IK looks at the world not, not just objectively detached, Again, you probably heard Unchi Maka, the word Lakota means Mother Earth. Again, uh, there's a sense of gratitude towards that. Uh, we know that indigenous knowledge you know, is accumulated observations, trial and error, success and mistakes, handed down from our ancestors. But we also believe that it's critical for our survival and our sustainability uh, because we've been at these places for thousands of years, accumulated knowledge about these places. So it's important that our voice gets recognized, our knowledge gets recognized. And so science needs our input. And that's what's happening right now with, uh, with the um, indigenous uh, knowledge guidance document. So we as indigenous need to, need to also contribute to that and come to the table. And finally, um, I think we're, we both needed to really look at the planet. Our elders talk about the importance of working together uh, to heal the planet, to reconcile with the land. So these are things that we must do. Next slide. So thank you. I want to thank you all for listening, um, hearing me, and I say, and we say, thank you all very much for listening, 
We also say midato ya oyasi. It means all my relations. It reminds us, we say that after every talk we give, every prayer we give, and every ceremony we do. It's a recognition again of our connection to creation, but also to one another. So thank you for listening. And uh, that concludes my talk. Oh, to fellow. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, James, for that presentation. We really appreciate it. At this time, we're going to go into a Q&A session. So if you do have questions, please put them into the chat or email them to the um, broadcast at fws.gov. Um, James, while you were providing your presentation to us, there are many comments that came in about um, answering your question about challenges. Some folks put in opportunities that they see. Um, we have a couple of questions. So I will, I'll read over a few of the challenges and then we'll go into some of the questions first. Okay. Right, I mean, first I'll read over some of the challenges, then we'll go into questions. I'm very tongue twisted today. Um, so one of them was that the, this person finds that TEK is unevenly distributed amongst the various Native Americans that they've interacted with. Um, another challenge was not wanting to be intrusive in asking tribal nations about TEK. And I think we have a question relating to that. Um, let me scroll here. So yeah, could you briefly provide guidance or your thoughts? Um, how do you recommend federal employees move forward with sometimes unrealistic deadlines while trying to honor a tribe's uh, data, data sovereignty? So where we're not wanting to be intrusive to a tribal nation, but we also at the same time want to incorporate that TEK into our federal decision-making What's that fine line that we try to walk? Well, thank you for the question. That's a good question. Um, I think um, we cannot you know, obviously go back in time to, uh, to reestablish or, or, or build these relationships. But I do think that to this year uh, with this memorandum, that's why I brought this memorandum of understanding into the conversation today is that you know, that's, a real, that's a real thing. Uh, again, first time ever that I've seen where you know, there's a, I think there's a real opportunity between the tribes and the federal government to come together to really understand how we bring TEK into decision making. Really the tribes are care about the land uh, as others and we care about the land and uh, we have a certain responsibility to that and uh, we want to see a healthy landscape. Um, you know, those of our lands outside of resident boundaries for instance, you know, that's our traditional homeland. We still have connection uh, to those cultural resources, to hunting and to fishing rights and to treaty rights. So I think that um, I think we all need to get together and work on this memorandum of understanding uh, uh, effort. That's number one. I think uh, federal agencies need to respond to that. Those comments, those questions. I think tribes need to respond to that. And we're going to have a, a draft document by the end of this year, 2022. And and again, that's going to be the guidance for federal managers and such to work with. Uh, it's a big big task. We understand that. We understand the diversity of challenges with the different tribal cultures, but at the same time, I think that, um, that this is the opportunity before us today. Uh, I think um, it's, it's not too late, not too late to start relationship building with tribal nations. Though there's deadlines and things like that, I think um, we still can we still can begin. And I do think that um, um, building networks uh, among yourselves as, as federal federal managers, so to speak. Uh, you know, really sharing uh, your relationships with tribal leaders and resource managers too. Uh, I think that's important. I think you have to share your network and, 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 and also try to reduce some of those silos between federal agencies and how they work with tribal nations, for instance. You know, can you break down some of those barriers and share, share things and to uh, work together, uh, you know, be more efficient in the communications and even to complement and to build upon each other's work. Now that's a maybe a pie in the sky kind of a thing, but but I do think that um, we got to keep trying on that. And finally, I would say is um, you know we have these liaisons now in place. Um, you know we need to figure out how to 
you know, support those people and, and get them the responsibility and opportunity to weigh in and be part of a project so that they're also sharing their network with you and those who don't know. Uh, maybe we can kind of advance quicker in terms of relationship building with each other so that uh, we can get to the real heart of the work, if you will, and problems we're trying to solve. Okay. Thank you for sharing those thoughts. Yeah, there's, I feel like there's many steps that need to be taken from the federal employment side um, where everybody needs to be on the same page and it's getting them there. That is the challenge, but hopefully we can get them there. And hopefully with information like you've provided today, this is a helpful tool to assist with that. So um, a few other challenges that folks have put into the chat is uh, not enough indigenous knowledge holders on staff referring to the federal government. Um, so we could work towards increasing representation there. Um, let's see here. One of them, this kind of ties to what we spoke about already, incorporating TEK into the Fish and Wildlife Service species status assessment process um, and allowing enough time to fully discover the breadth of knowledge and balancing that with our deadlines. Yeah. Um, let's see, an opportunity that somebody pointed out was that TEK can improve federal decision-making, which I wholeheartedly agree with. Let's see. One, okay, how can tribes make sure they are getting their representatives at the table? That's a question that just came into the chat. So how can tribes make sure they are getting their representatives at the table? Well, I, I think that uh, there, there are great um, native native organizations, um, non you know, nonprofits like National Congress for Indian and others across the country that are good at sharing information, disseminating these opportunities, like um, like what we talked about with this White House initiative. Uh, we uh, and so I work at the ESA, so that's a mainstream science organization, right? But but they're also um, they're also engaging with this with these comments. So we're going to put a policy statement together from ESA, representing ESA to the TEK. So I think that you know, looking at these organizations that have, are working with tribes, again, it's all about the network. Uh, really figuring out, developing maybe an enhanced platform for communication of these things. Uh, we know tribes, to their point, uh, is that they're busy with other things. So it's, it's been a challenge for even for us at Rosebud really to get climate on the agenda for the tribe, let alone getting them to really deeply engage with um, what's needed, what's understood uh, to make progress, to prepare for a changing climate. Um, I do think that um, your center, NCTC, you know, they, they, you have a role as well. Uh, these organizations that are uh, promote education and workshops and stuff, you know, you need to begin on the, on the edge of this work and continue to um, uh, build new tribal partnerships. Remember that it's not static, it's dynamic. And so every year we have new travel employees come into travel, travel programs as employees. And so uh, with our new tools, we should see that we should be able to begin to build uh, a great network among travel nations. Um, I think uh, also is uh, paying attention to you know, what's happening in Indian country as far as programs and conferences. I mean, the Zoom platform in some ways has allowed us to uh, you know, more efficiently collaborate with each other, learn what's going on, um, hear what the issues are, then the solutions. So I think we need to really think about our, our in, in communication infrastructure and how we're doing that, how well we're doing that. Uh, because it, it's, it's been useful to me in my work, uh, even though we prefer in person, but, but maybe it's still helpful to advance the agenda. And finally, I would say is cold management. We didn't talk about cold management today a lot, but that's another um, member of understanding from the federal government. So tribal nations are, are having the opportunity uh, to come to the table maybe and actually do um, subcontracting or 638 contracting maybe for some of these services of land management. I'm really excited about that as well. 
uh, this administration has opened that door, so to speak. And so the federal agencies will have to come together with tribes and figure out if that's a good way forward. I know in South Dakota, uh, we started, and I've been invited to be part of the meeting with the U.S. Forest Service, the Black Hills National Forest, a very, um, I would say, uh, important place to Lakota people. Uh, we have concerns about timber harvest. We have concerns about mining and environmental contamination. We have a concern about development, housing development. More and more people are moving into the Black Hills, which affects, we think, the quality of, of life there, um, affects our, our ceremonial life and our ceremonial season. And so we have to be there. And if there's opportunity to affect a management plan for the North Forest Service, then those doors are being opened. Maybe slowly, but they're being open. And so we got to come through there with our ideas. And that's where I think the importance of TEK can play in terms of those. So those are my thoughts, Jennifer. All right. Um, let's see here. The next, it, this is a comment followed by a question. Agencies will often pay biological consultants slash contractors for ecological data or knowledge. Could you please discuss the role of monetary compensation and gathering um, TEK from indigenous people? Well, that's a great question. I think, um, I think you know, something needs to change in terms of, um, of how we do that work. Uh, maybe that's a policy change really to bring on indigenous knowledge holders as, um, as consultants or experts uh, into those kind of projects and assessments. I do think it's important that we um, that we compensate um, traditional holders fairly, as we would any other expert. I think if we believe that TK is just as important Western science and has to be compensated by that, I do think in terms of um, you know how you might approach compensation, um, just think of it in terms of a you know a, a scientist or a GS, some important GIS knowledge expert at that GS level, and then compensate the um, Nods holder, you know, fairly and, and subsequently. Um, I do think that you know it's going it's going to have to happen because um, you know these knowledge holders are, are important, they're valuable, and I think that they can make great, great contributions to uh, these programs, these assessments, and these management plans. But I would say that it's really um, I'm not sure there's a set price if you want to will, but but I think we should take a look at the GS. The GS level system and see where a knowledge holder. And I think that's another effort that needs to happen as part of co-management and, and high tech. Okay, thanks for that input. Um, I've learned over time to talk to my colleagues who work with tribal nations, um, who speak to the elders in different tribes, to see what they find is valuable for them or compensates them and a manner that they they think is proper. So I've found that just reaching out to my colleagues has been a helpful tool for us to go that route. Um, let's see here. Is there any effort to inform the general public about the collaboration between the federal government and Native American tribes to incorporate TEK into natural resource management and why that is important? So how do we help the general public come to this knowledge? Well, you know, um, so I'm in South Dakota, I'm in the Black Hills, and I'm not sure how many parks we have, but I think parks, um, I know you're fish and wildlife, but I know parks, for instance, um, your sister agencies um, are tremendous uh, science education uh, places. I mean, how many millions of people visit parks every, every year, uh, the everyday American? So I think parks have an important role in things like that where uh, we can have um, people and uh, programs and, uh, and literature or posters or even videos and multimedia kind of things that would talk about, promote, navigate uh, traditional knowledge. Um, I think storytelling um, is another important medium. Art, you mentioned art and film. I think those are very powerful vehicles to, to share information and to bring uh, tribal perspectives into the discourse. Um, I, I do think that um, increasingly as this, again, I use that Fed White House guideline document process go forward, 
I mean, they're collecting a lot of information about these challenges and these opportunities. And so I think something will come from that document, that information in terms of uh, new strategies to educate the public. And finally, I think it starts with us. You here on the call today, given, you know, if, I've, if I have been helpful to you at all today, um, and, and if you can see and understand uh, what I'm trying to communicate with you, then you need to share that uh, with your colleagues and with your family and your school system and children and grandchildren. You know, what we're talking about here today is, is um, really, you know, if we believe in climate change, it's real and it's going to affect all of us, then we all have a responsibility to, to do our part. So then I put it back on you is that what you hear today, and there are many other indigenous speakers like myself, you're probably even better ones. That, but there's books you can read, uh, there's good scholarship. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, I think it becomes on, back on you to take that responsibility to learn. And and there are guys like us are around. We're willing to come and speak and talk and engage and even even do projects and workshops that we can go deeper into this. So there are those out there like 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 us, and we feel this is important work. And, and we're learning as we go as well. We don't say that we're the experts on all this stuff, but you know, for me, it's been 25 years of working here, working with people, all kinds of people in America now around the world. And so what I've learned is that you know it starts with the relationship. And if we can build good relationships with each other, I think we can tackle those really tough issues that are before us. And we can re reconcile, we can, re we can uh, resolve maybe, and go forward. Always remember it's for our grandchildren. And we all agree that our grandchildren are important. I'm a, as a grandfather myself, you know, I think about my granddaughter every day. And I see the world and news every day. And I'm wondering what kind of world is she coming into? So we all got to do our part. If, if we can agree on one thing, it's for our grandchildren, our children, grandchildren. Well, let's work together to do that, and we can, I believe. That's hope. Yes. Well, we have just about a minute left. I'm going to try to get in two more quick thoughts. Um, the first one I'm going to share is a thought, and maybe you have a brief reaction to how to overcome this. We are not seen as a legitimate source of science knowledge because our practice is traditional knowledge and not data. I, I think you kind of hit this in your, your slide with the three individuals on the Hill that they are collecting data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but what's your initial reaction to that? Well, I think that, uh, you know, when we talk about equity, we talk about centering, like centering justice, and we talk about uh, diversity, inclusion. Um, I, I think of it that, um, you know, tribal nations are rebuilding, uh, restoring. We're restoring our languages. We're restoring our spirituality. We're restoring our educational systems. And even, in, I, I've been using this lately, and I'm not sure if this is right, but for me, instead of using the word decolonization, I'm using the word re-indigenization re-indigenization and to me that's that to me that's more of a positive encouraging kind of a term uh, because it's, it's it's recognizing what happened to us as indigenous people but also it's it's putting it's putting the, the onus again back on us that we have to reclaim um, our languages we have to deal with things that we got to deal with we have to reinvigorate and, and reinforce you know our ideas and we got to prepare our young people uh, in schools and college and, and, and work opportunities. And we got to protect our elders and our knowledge, and we got to learn from them and listen to them. Because what COVID-19 taught, taught us very harshly is that our elders are vulnerable. And we lost many vulnerable, we lost many elders this year. Many of our, our language speakers are connections to the past. And so, so we have to prepare ourselves as well. Um, I know our partners you know, can do the same thing. Uh, but I think that it starts with us in a way. Um, and we have to develop good, strong governance systems. Our travel council's got to be better. Our policies have to be better. Uh, we just, with, with, with what we have in terms of resources, uh, we have no choice. We just have to utilize the resources better in more effective ways. So we have to be better governance people. We have to learn to understand work with science and data because we can do it. Uh, there's a book called Lakota America. Now, if you're interested in Lakota culture, my culture, there's a book called Lakota America, a tremendous book. It's a history book talking from the 1600s to the present day. 
And what that book told me was that Lakota people are very resilient people. Uh, we were diplomats. We were warriors. Uh, we were all those things. And we were working with different cultures way before even America began. And so uh, we, it's in us uh, to work and to function and to thrive. And, and that's an example, again, of, of taking a look at history and how we traded, how we educated ourselves, how we intermarried, how we build relationships with people that were different than ourselves. And so those are things I think that are important as we go forward. Thank you. Okay. Well, it's time to wrap up. Um, we have had several requests from viewers wondering if they could access or utilize your presentation. Yes. Okay. So I would encourage you, if you would like to utilize or have information from James's presentation, please email me. My name is Jennifer underscore Hill at fws.gov. And I will get those materials to you. Thank you, James, for being willing to share those. Um, and we thank you for sharing your knowledge with us today, spending time with us, um, getting ready for the presentation and doing the presentation. And I would encourage viewers to please plan to join us for our next Indigenous Connections broadcast titled Music, Nature, and NICAUC with Frank Juan Lakota. That'll be on Wednesday, April 20th at 3 p.m. Each broadcast is recorded and they are available on NCTC's website. If you wish to learn more about future broadcasts or be added to the listserv, please just email me and I'll gladly do that. And thank you for joining us today. Bye-bye.